Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all here this morning. If you go ahead and uh, make your way to your seats, that'd be great. We can get started with our service. All right. Well, it's great to see you all here today. Uh, if you're new here, we would love to connect with you. And the best way that we do that is we have a little green check-in card in the pew rack in front of you. And you can fill that out with your info. Um, and then if you want, you can bring it back to the kiosk at the end of service in the lobby. And we have a little gift for you if you're new here. I mean, we'd love to give you that gift and get your contact info so we can uh, give you a call during the week and just check in with you and get to know you and just get that relationship formed. So if you are new here, please fill one of those out uh, and bring it uh, by the kiosk after service. That'd be great. And also, if you guys want to update us on anything, if you have a prayer request or anything new is going on in life, you can use that green checking card as well to let us know what's going on or what we can be praying for for you. So uh, we're going to go through our announcements real quick here, and then we'll get going with our service. A few things uh, to cover. First of all, today, uh, for those of you who have been interested or are connected with our Belize mission trip, we're having a meeting right after service today for that. So that'll be in the fellowship hall, and that is for... Um, anyone interested in that, whether you're going on the trip, you filled out your application and you're going, or you filled out an application and you want to be uh, a sender, you wanna, you're want you going to be here, but you still are going to help out. So you are a sender, you're helping send people to go to Belize, um, and then also our travelers are the ones who are going on the trip. So if you're at all tied to the Belize mission trip, um, we are having a meeting after service today in the fellowship hall. Be there for that. And if you guys have any questions about that at all, if you're hearing about this for the first time, talk to Lori Holst. She can give you all the info about it um, and let you know anything uh, you need to know. Uh, we have Harvest Festival coming up. It is a nice rainy fall day outside. We're transitioning. We got some nice precipitation. Praise God. So uh, hopefully it doesn't get too hot again. But we are getting to that time of year, and so we are getting ready for our Harvest Festival. So we as a church uh, come together and serve in that, and so we need help in a variety of ways. We need help with candy donations. We need, like, tons of candy, literally tons of candy. Um, we need help running booths. We need help running games. We need help um, serving different items. Um, we need help with donations and all these things. So if you can help out in any way, please look over this orange flyer and see how you can help. Um, we don't have location hard confirmed yet. We're trying potentially at elementary school or at Sisson. We can't get the armory this year, um, but we are trying to be in town still. And so once we get that nailed down, we will have location and time confirmed for that. Um, so just stay tuned for that. But if you can help out in any way, please fill this out and let us know how you can help with that. Um, and then put this in the offering plate as it goes by or bring it by uh, the kiosk at the end of service. And then uh, class 101 is this coming Saturday. So if you had signed up for that, this Saturday at 1 p.m. here at the church, we're going to have our class 101 meeting. Um, and that's for anyone who's interested in becoming a member of the church. We just go over um, who we are as a church, what we believe, um, and how, how we serve in ministry in those ways. And so it is a prerequisite for being a member at this church. So if you have any questions about that, come talk to me or come, go talk to Brandon at the end of service, and we can give you more info on that. Um, but yeah, hope to see some of you guys there this Saturday for that. And then uh, a cool thing... Um, some of you guys know Jennifer Summers, Jen Summers. She is working on getting her master's in counseling through Liberty University. And so there's a, there's a blurb in the bulletin to read, um, but she, she needs to get hours for her counseling. Um, and so she uh, is putting herself out there. There's a text or an email that you can send um, your info to, and she will send you a link to sign up for an appointment. And it says in there, um, you can schedule a preliminary session with her at no cost. And so after that, there's probably a little bit of a cost to it. But if you guys are all interested in some counseling, um, Jen is awesome, and um, she's kind of working on getting that degree. So that is there if you're at all interested in that. You can talk to Brandon and me after service about that too. Um, or you can just give Jen a call or shoot her an email um, for more info on that. And then last but not least, as you guys know, we're in the month of September, and for this whole month, we are doing a love offering for Operation Christmas Child to help cover the funds that we 
need to pack up all the shoe boxes that we do to fill the shoe boxes that we're going to send out. And so um, we have this little insert in the bulletin that gives you the idea of um, what you can put in there, what not to include. There's like a little blurb on what not to include in there. Um, but lots of good things in there. And there's a little story on the back, too, about um, just the blessings that o OCC has throughout the world. And this is one little highlight. And so uh, we just want to continue to encourage you guys about the three ways that you can participate. We have a wall in the lobby of shoe boxes. And our hope is that everyone is taking a shoe box home with them to pack on their own, um, to put in your own gifts with your own ideas, put in your own letter with that. And so you can get connected with a kid somewhere around the world with that. Um, OCC has huge impacts. And it's spreading the gospel to kids all over the world and families all over the world. And so we encourage you guys as well to be considering, prayerfully considering how you can give above and beyond what you normally do to help uh, support that ministry, help support us as we're sending out as many shoe boxes as we can around the world. Um, so to get us in the mindset of that and get us thinking and praying over it, we have a video to watch. So we'll watch that and then Jeff will come up and do our scripture reading. What an amazing story of God's provision, even when things are tough. Sometimes it's hard to keep perspective when things are so tough. But we know that God is faithful, right? And if we persevere, um, God, will, God will get the glory. Um, as we move into Psalm 119, as our, as our scripture reading this morning, we will find out how we can go about being faithful. The psalmist here, or whoever's speaking here, will give us instructions on how to, how to stay faithful and how to keep that perspective so let's read. We're going to read Psalm 119. And just in case you're wondering, we won't be reading the whole entire thing. <laughs> we'll be reading uh, verses 1 through 27. Yeah, if you guys want to stand out, that'd be great. We'll honor God's word. Here we go. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. They also do not do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. You have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. Then I would not be ashamed when I look into all your commandments. I will praise you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I will keep your statutes. Oh, do not forsake me utterly. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts. I will contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Deal bountifully, bountifully with your servant, that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes, that I may see wondrous things from your law. I am a stranger in the earth. Do not hide your commandments from me. My soul breaks with longing for your judgments at all times. You rebuke the proud, the cursed, those who stray from your commandments. Remove from me reproach and contempt. I have kept your testimonies. Princes also sit and speak against me, but your servant meditates on your statutes. Your testimonies also have delight, are my delight and my counselors. My soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. I have declared your ways, and you have answered me. Teach me, your, teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts. So shall I meditate on your wonderful works. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and the importance of it. Lord, I pray as it is here in Scripture that you would open our eyes. Lord, help us to see how you would have us to react and to respond to every situation in our lives. Lord, I pray that we would not forget the ways you have worked in our lives to work through the good and the bad. Lord, keep our hearts and minds focused on your word as Brandon comes to preach this morning. Direct us all. In your name we pray. Amen. Psalm chapter 40. We'll be in Psalm chapter 40. I'd appreciate that. 
If you don't have a Bible, you can use the Bible there in the pew rack in front of you. And if you don't have a Bible at home, you can certainly take one of those home. That is a gift to you. We'd love for you to have one. I think everyone should have the Word of God and love the Word of God and use the Word of God. We, uh, we've got a couple more, three more, three more messages in Psalms this quote-unquote summer, right? It's now fall, basically, right? Um, we're going to finish up what is called Book 1 of the Psalms, and that gets us through Chapter 41. Uh, not today. Right? But today we're going to look at verse, uh, verses 1 through 8 in chapter 40. I'd encourage you to grab your, uh, your message notes out of the bulletin. If you grabbed those, uh, you can follow along with that. Uh, the scriptures are there. Uh, and again, you don't have to follow along with me, with the scriptures. You don't have to keep, try to keep up, because that could be very difficult to do. I'd rather you be able to listen and take notes, but those are there for your reference later on. Uh, you can go back and, and uh, look at the references that were used today. Uh, and the sermon points are there as well if I go too fast. So that's there for you. Also, on the back of that, we've mentioned that before, but on the back is a discussion sheet. So uh, it's questions you can just do on your own and kind of read and respond, uh, or you can do it with your family, or you can do this in a small group. Uh, a great opportunity to take what we have learned today and what God is going to teach us, and then to digest that and to chew that up, chew that up a bit, right, and, and, and discuss that. So that's a really uh, good way to do that and uh, enter into more discussion. So glad to be here. We are, again, Psalm 40, verses 1 through 8. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and pray for us, and then we're going to uh, read uh, those, those passages, that passage, okay? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your love and your mercy. Uh, God, we come here just remembering how, how faithful you are and how, how your faithful love has surrounded us and drawn us into a, a deep relationship with you. God, we ask that as we're here today that we would continue to glorify you. God, we have done so in song and exalted your name. We, we thank you for the opportunity to do that. God, now as we look to your word, we ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to be receptive. That God, we have, we have gone to you in worship, we have gone to you in prayer, and now we are at, we're asking you to speak back to us. May we hear from you. May we have ears and hearts that listen today. God, may the words that I share not be my own, but be yours. God, we want to hear from you. We want to learn from you. We want to be convicted of sin, God, and drawn into a, a more re, uh, repentant and obedient, faith-filled relationship with you. So we pray this, and we pray it in Jesus' good name. Amen. So we'll, we're going to read Psalm 40. Uh, we'll read 1 through, uh, 1 through 8. For the choir director, a psalm of David. Happy is the one, I'm sorry, that's the wrong one. Verse 40, chapter 40, skip ahead. Uh, for the choir director, a psalm of David. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me, and he heard my cry for help. He brought me up from a desolate pit, out of the muddy clay, and set my feet on a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear, and they will trust in the Lord. How happy is anyone who has put his trust in the Lord and has not turned to the proud or to those who run after lies. Lord, my God, you have done many things. Your wondrous works and your plans for us, none can compare with you. If I were to report and speak of them, they are more than can be told. You do not delight in sacrifice and offering. You open my ears to listen. You do not ask for a whole burnt offering or a sin offering. Then I said, see, I have come in the scroll. It is written about me. I delight to do your will, my God. And your instruction is deep within me. This is God's word. So today we're going to look at uh, Psalm 40. And, you know, it's, it's been one of those thematic um, events right? in the Psalms. You see a lot of lament where David has been struggling in some way and he's had, uh, had some kind of force or pressure around him and he's called out to God for rescue, whether it be from uh, physical or emotional or mental state or spiritual. He's, he's crying out for God to rescue him. And, um, and today I've titled the sermon, Ready to Do His Will. And we see that there in verse 6 uh, of, of the psalm uh, where the psalmist writes, he says, uh, I'm sorry, um, I delight to do, uh, in verse eight. I delight to do your will, my God. Uh, there's there's a, should be a readiness and a delight in us to do His will. And I think David is there, and he's he's crying out, saying, "God, you've rescued me. You have done this, and I I want to be the person that you've called me to be." Uh, in view of the pit of despair that I'm in, or the life that we have around us, uh, and, and would we agree that life brings pits of despair? Amen. Yeah. Uh, whatever that happened, da David is contemplating here, and he's he's proclaiming. The desire to rise above those pits and those despairs. He, he's, he's wanting to proclaim that he wants to be uh, found trusting in God and found obedient in God. So, so he wants to live life sold out 
for God. And, and that's what it means when we look at being ready to do God's will. It is, it is saying, I want to be ready <clears throat> to do God's will because I am sold out with God. And I think you and I, if we were being honest, would say that, that really is my deepest prayer. I, I want to be sold out. I want to be all his. I don't want to, I don't want to have anything of mine in the way. Now, if, if you're here and you're like, well, no, Brandon, I really do want some of me. Well, that's, that's on you, right? And you've got to do some business with God. But, but when we come humbly to God and realize who he is, we should, we should say, God, I'm ready to do your will and, and teach me. What does that mean? So today we're going to look at three aspects uh, in the first half of Psalm 40, uh, seeing what David says uh, is, is helpful to do God's will, to be ready to do God's will. Okay, so number one is this. You look at your notes there, or you're writing it down. Number one, uh, being ready to do his will, we wait on the Lord with confidence. If you and I are going to be ready to do his will, it means we're waiting for our orders. And we're waiting that he is going to bring orders and that he has direction for us and he has plans for us. And we wait with confidence then, right? So we wait with confidence. Uh, if we look at verse 1 of Psalm 40, David says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me, and he heard my cry for help. So the first part of this section we see is that he hears us when, he, when we call. It's so important for us to know that. You know, I think too many of us get discouraged because he doesn't answer the prayers that we give him directly. Like, I, I ask for something, and he doesn't come through. God must not be what? Listening. But is that true? Is that fair? I do that with my daughter all the time, right? I, I listen to what she says, I'm hearing her, and I respond, and then she accuses me, or my son accuses me of, Daddy, you're not listening to me. No, I'm just not doing what you want, right? I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to reason and talk with you. I, I heard, and I can articulate back every single thing you just told me, but God's not far from us, right? He's, he's, he's not, just because he doesn't, doesn't do what you want him to do or what I want him to do, doesn't mean he's not listening to us. So that, that's something that's very important for us to get. We can be confident in the Lord that he hears us when we cry. That he hears our prayers to him. That he is not far off. What we have to be willing to do then is listen for the answer. You know, we come to, come to church, and I've, I've said this even in my prayer today. We worship God. We, God, you're worthy. You're, you're, you're to be exalted. You're the only one. And then we pray, God, we want to hear from you. Right? Here's our concerns, and we want to give them to you. And then we open the word and let him what? Speak to us. We let him respond to us. Will it be what we wanted it to be? Maybe not. But it'll be what God needed it to be and wanted it to be for us. So we are ready to hear. Hear my cry for help. Right? So uh, I waited patiently and heard my cry. Psalm 132 says this, Lord, listen to my voice, let your ears be attentive to my cry for help. There's that plea of, God, I, I, I know you're there. I, I need to know you're listening. Psalm 116, I, I love the Lord because he has heard my appeal for mercy. He has heard it. And, and we have to be satisfied with God saying yes or no or how about this way instead or maybe later. But knowing that he has heard our cry. I love you, Lord, because you've heard my appeal for mercy, because he has turned his ear to me. I will call out to him as long as I live. Because we know he listens, we know he hears, we should be able to call out to him as long as we live. And knowing that, that's that confidence, right? We wait confidently on the Lord. <clears throat> we know that, God, I, you're going to hear me all the days of my life. You're always going to hear what I have, I have to say and what's going on in my heart. But help me trust your answer. Help me trust your response. Back to Psalm 40, uh, we look at verse 2. So we wait on the Lord with confidence, right? And, and we, we know he hears our cry. Uh, next, he brought me up from the desolate pit out of the muddy clay and set my feet on a rock, making my steps secure. That is, that is so freeing. If you, would, if you, if you read that and, and take that in and understand from the, the depth from which God has reached down and pulled you and me up, right? We know where we have been. We know where we were, and maybe for you today, it's there now. You're in this miry clay. You're in this quicksand, and every, every move you make gets you deeper. God is the God of your salvation, and we reach up to him and let him pull us out of the pit, and he pulls us out of that pit not to throw us back in the quicksand. He pulls us out of the pit to set our feet on a solid rock, safe and secure. Psalm 18 says this, You make my spa uh, a spacious place beneath me for my steps, and my ankles do not Give way. Your notes might be wrong there at Psalm 18, 36, not 46. It's so important for us to have a sure footing in the Lord, a solid rock to stand. So when we know there's something solid to stand on, we can wait with confidence. He goes on in verse 3. 
So he's made our, our steps secure. He's heard our cry. Verse 3, he put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear, and they will trust in the Lord. See, he puts a song in us, not just to take care of our own heart, but to be as a witness as well. I want to look at a passage in Isaiah chapter 12. I want to read some things to you to, to help build this case. Uh, on that day, he will, uh, you will say, I will give thanks to you, Lord. Although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away. So here's the things that God has done that we have confidence in him about. He has turned his anger away from me. He has, you have comforted me. Indeed, God is my salvation. I will trust him and not be afraid. For the Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. You will, you will joyfully draw water from the springs of salvation. And on that day, you will say. So there's all these things that we can be confident in God about. And as we are confident in God because of who he is and what he's done in our life, that should well up in us what? A song to sing. Praise out of our mouths, out of our heart to God for what he has done. He says, on that day, you will say, you're going to sing and proclaim. Give thanks to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make his works known among the peoples. Declare that his name is exalted. There should be a testimony. <clears throat> As we wait confidently for the Lord, we know he hears us. right? He, and we know that he helps us stand sure, on sure footing, on sure foundation. And he puts a new song in our heart. You know, there, there are times we, we, well, we come together, right? And as we gather together on Sunday mornings, we sing together, don't we? <clears throat> the way our, our structure is set up, maybe this is news to you, and maybe this will be helpful to you and beneficial to you, because it's not the way we've always done it, right? But so we've structured this, that when we, we come together for worship, we, we start with the Word of God. We say, God, we're going we're gonna to be exalting you through the Word of God. We're going to make sure that we're positionally placing you in our hearts higher than anything else, that our focus is going to be on you, that our attention is going to be on you. We're not going to be distracted with something else. So we're going to confess our sin to you. We're going to read the Word and put ourselves in our own place. That's how we start our services now. And then we enter into a time of worship. And those worship songs, usually in the front end of our service, are songs of exaltation, of like, let's just lift it up. Let's lift up Jesus. Let's praise him. We need to put him in his place, not only uh, spiritually, quietly in my own heart as we read the scripture. We need to put him in his place as we sing it out about him. God, you are worthy, and we're going to tell you you're worthy. And not only when we sing, this is what's important about singing. When we sing to God worship songs, we're not only singing to God because he deserves it, right? He certainly deserves all of it. But as we sing those songs, we're singing those songs to our own heart. It's a preaching time. It's a, it's a time where we preach and say, hey, yeah, Brandon, God is that cool. God is that great. God is that big. God is that mighty. He is. Why were you thinking he wasn't? How many times I have been wrecked just by singing a worship song and had to be quiet because God was dealing with my heart as I sung and it preached the word to my heart. And then it's encouraging. We do that together. I'm not here by myself. I'm here with you. And those times where I'm discouraged or those times I'm distracted, you're singing next to me or you're singing behind me and, and I, maybe you heard my voice behind you. We're singing these songs to one another because there's a song in my heart. And sometimes our brothers and sisters need to hear that preached to them because they're just not preaching it to themselves that well that day. So we not only do we sing worship songs to God, we sing worship songs to our own heart, we sing worship songs to our brethren, our brothers and sisters' hearts, so they would be reminded of God's goodness and glory and his grandeur. And then, get this, this is, I put a new song in your heart, a hymn of praise in your mouth, right? That many will see and fear and they will trust in the Lord. Those are not people who believe. So if you're, maybe you're here today and you, I, I haven't never believed in Jesus really. I don't really know what this means. I'm checking it out. Awesome, I'm glad you're here. When we sang, we were singing and proclaiming how great God was so that you might see and that you might fear the Lord and come to him in faith and that you would trust him as the Lord of your life. Our singing is evangelism as well. It is a witness to others. So it exalts God. It sings truth to our own heart. It sings truth to our brothers and sisters' hearts. And it shares the gospel with people who do not know Jesus. Amen? Who wants to sing? Let's get the worship team back up, right? That, but, but how often do we say, well, I got the preaching. I'm done for the day. I'm good. That's all I needed today. Or I don't like this type of music or this song. I'll be quiet. Do you understand that as, as we say, I'm ready to do your will, God, that I will wait on the Lord with confidence and he will put a new song in my heart and if there's a new song in my heart, I will not be able to keep from singing it. So if we keep from singing it, that new song may not be a new song. 
That confidence that you claim may not be true confidence in the Lord, and you and I should be worried and concerned about that. I'm not saying you have to be the best singer. I'm not saying you have to be the loudest singer. What I'm saying is that when Jesus does something for us, when he saves us, when he, we know he hears us, and when he sets our feet on firm foundations, and when we trust in him and wait confidently in him, I know the scriptures say he puts a new song in your heart, and that new song will in turn affect other people as well. That that should be taking place in each believer's heart and in each worship service that we have. Amen? The question I ask is, is there a new song in your heart? Are you ready to sing that song? Are you ready to proclaim that? I I love the Psalms. Uh, This one's been particularly tough because uh, there's so many different worship songs that have have been written because of this Psalm. And so many different, I've I've been singing different Psalms and songs all week long. And and I just, I'm trying to get it out of my head, but I can't. So I just don't fight it. I want it in there because I want that song to be in my heart, that this is who God is and what he's done for us. So we give thanks to the Lord. We proclaim his name. We make his works known among the peoples declare that his name is exalted. If I want to be ready to do his will, I wait confidently on the Lord. I wait on, wait on the Lord with confidence. I trust in him, right? He hears me. He makes me solid where I stand, and he gives me a new song so I, can, I don't have to share just from my own skill. He puts it in my heart to overflow to others around. Number two, <clears throat> if I want to be ready to do his will, it's this. We have to trust and remember what the Lord has done. We have to trust and remember what the Lord has done. Car- carrying on here in Psalm 40, uh, verses 4 and 5. Uh, look at verse 4. How happy or is anyone who has put his trust in the Lord and has not turned to the proud or to those who run after lies. Let's stop there for a minute. We trust. This, the point was trust and remember what the Lord has done. Trust is huge. We, we give our trust way, way too readily to so many things in this world. Right? We trust the cashier is going to give us right change. We, we trust that the scanning device is going to actually scan the right item. We trust our neighbor to be neighborly. And, and how many times has that trust failed us? Right? More than we can count. And so we keep searching for where we put our trust. And what, what the psalmist would write and what Scripture would say is we should trust in the one that is true. Right? He says in, in verse 4, again, how happy is the one who puts his trust in the Lord right? and not to the proud, and not to those who run after lies. Well, and that makes sense, right? I, I don't want to trust in those who are proud. They, they think they're all that, and they're, they're going to fail. And I don't want to trust in the ones who are running after lies, because I don't want to live my life based on a lie. It makes total sense when we say it like that, but we spend so much of our time running after those who lie, and truths that aren't truths. All the while, God's right there saying, listen, if you want to be ready to do my will, trust me. I'm the one that's true. I'm the one that will be always faithful for you. We see this in Jeremiah chapter 17. The person who trusts in the Lord, who, whose confidence indeed is in the Lord, is blessed. So it's like, hey, you put your trust somewhere, it's going to work out. He will be, you and I that, that are trusting the Lord, will be like a tree planted by the water, and it sends its roots out toward the stream, and it doesn't fear when heat comes and its foliage remains green, it will not worry in a year of drought or cease producing fruit. What is it saying? It says that that we can have trust. There's something secure that we can can be planted in Christ and produce a fruit in him in season and out of season. We don't have to worry. It's like, do I have enough? Have I done enough? Am I going to be squared away? No, in him we are. Those who trust in him are blessed. They are blessed. And, and so we, we abide in him. We send our roots down in him. We go to his word to be filled up and to be encouraged and strengthened in truth because he has the truth. But it's more than that, isn't it? He has the truth, but it's deeper because he what? He is the truth. He is the truth. We see this in First John. We see it in John 14, 6, right? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, Jesus says. But in First John chapter 5, So we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that. So he's saying that, listen, we've seen the Son, and and John would have, he's already made a huge argument that this is not just some human being in the flesh, that's just just flesh and bones, this is God in the flesh, this is a God of God right among us, that he is the divine, perfect Son of God. And he's come so that we may know the true one. What's he saying? When you've seen Jesus, you've seen the one that is true. And we are in the true one. That is, that is in his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true 
God. So there, what does it say? Jesus Christ, the Son, is the true what? God. Jesus Christ is God. You understand? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all God. He is the true God and the eternal life. So not only does he have the truth, he is the truth. So we run to him to be in the truth. And, that, and blessed are those who do. We, we, and so for you and I to be ready to do his will, there has to be this, this thing of trust that says, you know what, I'm not going to trust in anything else but Jesus. I'm not going to hope in anything else but Jesus. All, for, if I want truth, if I want solid teaching, if I want to know what reality is all about, then I am going to go to Jesus. And John wraps this passage up this way. He says, we, we are in the one that is the Son, and he is the true God and eternal life. And then he gives us a, a encouragement. Little children, because of what I've just said, because Jesus is the one that has the truth and is the truth, and he's God, little children, guard yourselves from idols. Guard yourselves from idols. Keep yourself from idols. And, and so that's, that's the opposite here. When we, are one, we say, God, I'm ready to do your will, trusting has to be in him. We can't be ready to do his will and say, well, I'm ready to do your will, but I'm going to go over here and embrace these things. Embrace these ideas and these, uh, these, these notions or these preferences or these, my, own, my own way. It says, I am going to trust in God. And I'm going to trust in him alone because he is the one that's true and he has truth. So we don't run to inferior things is what he's saying. Don't run to inferior things. God has what is best. And that, this is the truth of the gospel as well. When we talk about coming and gathering together, and I, mean, I said maybe some of you are here today and you don't have this relationship with Christ. You don't know what it's about, but you're, you're checking it out. I, I'm glad you're here. You should be. I want you to know Jesus. But know this. He is not an, an inferior God. He is the God. He is the God that is, is mighty to save. You see, and see, here's the trouble. We as human beings live in this fallen world. We talk about the pit and the despair and, and the sin that is everywhere. And the Bible says everyone has sinned and fallen short of God's standard. So we're, we're all in the same boat, right? We're all, we've all made mistakes. We're all separated from God. And there's not one single little G God Savior on this earth that could ever fix and mend that relationship between you and the Heavenly Father, Yahweh God, big G God. Nothing on this earth. Nothing that you aspire to do, not, not enough good, not enough resume, nothing you can do can bring you back to him, except the one that is satisfying and not inferior, and that is Jesus Christ. You see, God came and put on human flesh, and, and, we, and we love that. We're like, oh, Jesus was around, and he was among us, and he taught us such great things, and, and he told us just, just to, to love each other, and, and by our love, we'll, then they'll know that you're for me, and those are good things. He did. But Jesus didn't put on flesh to come teach you things only. His main goal in putting on flesh is so that he could lay that flesh down on a cross and be nailed to it and give up the life that that flesh gave. He breathed his last and shed his blood so that I could be forgiven of my sin and that you could be forgiven of your sin. Jesus died in my place where I deserve to die and he died in your place so that you and I could believe and have life. Now, how do we get life? We got, we got forgiveness through the, the, an atonement for sin through the death of Christ, right? But Christ, because he's God, did not stay dead. He rose victoriously, conquering death three days later. And because he lives, those that put their faith in Jesus Christ will also live. Amen? That's the gospel. That you, you try to tell me, tell me another God that's better and superior to that God. Try it. We live our lives trying to fool ourselves that way. Well, this is a better God. Oh, this is a better thing. I'll chase after this. And no, no, there's no other God that's superior than Jesus. He is the infinite, almighty God. And we deserve not only to, or he deserves our praise, and we can only come to him for our salvation. He is the one that is true. So don't run to inferior things. Run to God. Put your faith in him and trust in him. He is best. The next part of that verse we see in Psalm 40 is uh, verse 5. So we said, happy is the one who puts their trust in the Lord and not turn to the proud or to lies, right? And then it says, Lord my God, you have done many things. So there's a, a, a mindfulness coming. So I'm trusting in the Lord, and then I'm remembering what he's done. Lord, you've done many things. Your wondrous works and, uh, and your plans for us, none can compare with you. I, I wish we would understand that every moment of the day. If we look back 
on what God has done, not only in, in our life where he showed up and, and you can say, well, man, that was God. or that, God did spare me there. Or God did help me there. Or God did show me something there. We have all kinds of things to see. But if you look back just in the history of the world and say, God, let's look at where you showed up and your wondrous works, there is no one that compares. Do we get that? There is no one that compares. Lord, you have done many things, your wondrous works and your plans for us. None can compare. Not only are his works wondrous, but his plans for us are wondrous. Do we believe that? We, we sure make a lot of plans for ourselves, don't we? We sure ask other people's opinions of what the, our plans should be for ourselves. We, we listen to ads or read, read articles and oh, this, is, this is the plan now I have. What about God's plans? It says here in this passage, not only are his works, but his plans for us, none can compare. None can compare to the love and the care that he has for you. We have to remember his works and, and that he cares for you. Psalm 77 says this, God, your way is holy. What God is like God? Or what God is great like God? You are the God who works wonders. You received your, uh, you, you received, or sorry, revealed. You revealed your strength among the peoples and with power you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. Selah. There's such a, a depth of knowledge of, of knowing what God has done. We can look back and say, see, he's been faithful. How many times do we, do we disregard that, though? If we're ready to do his will, we have to be ready and, and, and to remember all that he's done because in a flash, we could lose sight of that. We, we talked about this this morning in Sunday school. right? We talked about the, the idea of, of the fires that went through weed recently, right? There's fires all over, but we, those are close to home. And, I, and I'm so grateful when I hear someone say, God was good, he, he spared my home. I, I, and I, I applaud that, I, I celebrate that. But does it mean that God wasn't good if his, your home burnt down? You see how quickly we lose sight of the wondrous works of God when we're in the pit? Yeah, I, I couldn't say that. I couldn't say if my home was standing or it wasn't standing. God is still what? God is still good. His wondrous works are still true. He is still the true one. I, he's still a firm foundation to stand on. My home's gone, or I'll need a new one. But he's not gone. He is still God. So he is good both if our homes are lost or if they're not lost. If our family member dies or doesn't die, God is still good. God is still God, and God still works wonders and reveals his strength and his power and redemption to all of humanity. And it's there for the taking so for you and I, ready to do his will means I'm going to trust in the one that's true and I'm going to remember all of his works and not forget those when times get hard. Don't set those aside. I want to tell you a story, just the thought of, uh, of this, and this has come up in, a, in several conversations recently, just because we have to remind, be reminded of this, right? And we're going to go into a, a sermon series pretty quick called Watch Your Mouth, and it's going to be tough. Trust me, I'm, I'm still like wanting to put it off, Right? But, but as we talk, as we, as we have these ideas formed about each other, like you did something to me or I did something to you, and, and, and I very well could have. And you, and, and you very well could have done something to me, but, but here's what I need to know. As you and I build relationships and rapports, and we, we base those relationships on the unity we share in the gospel of Jesus Christ and on the humility we want to cling to and on the word of God, as we do that together, let's let that bind us, right? And so when you offend me, I have to remember that that may be out of character, right? That I have to remember that, that all of the weight of this relationship, all of the, the things that God has done in our relationship with one another are not erased because of one word that went astray or one phrase that went astray. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Like we cannot erase a history of relationship with, with a person in, this, in, in faith just because of one isolated incident. Now, if there's... A habit, we'll, we'll talk about those things too when things start to become habitual and the conversation we might need to have. But we still want to say, you know what, we, we know each other. There's history here. There may be a year, there may be five years, there may be decades worth of solid history that we can cling to. So quickly though, we want to throw it all away. It's, oh, well, they, they're, this is how they are. No, I don't think so. That's how they were that moment. But that's not how they are. And the same is true with God. We may, we may be irked with God at some point, we may be disappointed with what happened or the, the outcome of something, but that does not take away the fact that he is still a God of wonders, 
a God of love, a God who is good, a God who will display and reveal his truth and his works to you and me. All right? Number three, if we want to be ready to do his will, this may be the hardest one, we need to dedicate ourselves to obedience. Dedicate yourself to obedience. If you want to be ready to do his will, you need to be ready to say, yes, Lord, I'll do that. Let's go on in our Psalm 40, verses 6 and 8, 6 through 8. So you, you do not delight in uh, sacrifice and offering. You open my ears to listen. Now let's stop there for a minute. This can be translated, this open my ears to listen. Um, it can be translated, ears you have dug for me. It's like God got a hold and said, I'm going to open your ears so you can hear and listen to what I'm saying to you right now, right? Uh, and if God has our ears, then we should listen to him. But there is a difference between hearing and listening, isn't there? Right? I said that a little bit about my kids. It's true in us, too. Hearing and listening, two different things. I can hear you and then not do it. I can hear you and decide that that's not what I want. I, I, but I hear you. What Jesus is asking of us is to hear him, and in hearing him, then we would do what he says. I just want to read a few verses that would really help us out in this, okay? And I, it really has convicted me. Maybe it'll convict you. Uh, from the book of Revelation, in fact, we went through these scriptures uh, when we did the letters to the churches, letters to the seven churches, right? Um, so uh, ha having ears to hear. Revelation 2, verse 7. Let anyone who has ears to hear, listen. So you have ears to hear, hear and listen. Verse 11, let anyone who has ears to hear, listen. Verse 17, let anyone who has ears to hear, listen. Verse 29, verse chapter 2, let anyone who has ears to hear, listen. I think you get this one. Verse 6 of chapter 3, go. Let anyone who has ears to hear, listen. Verse 13 of chapter 3, let anyone who has ears to hear, listen. In verse 22, let anyone who has ears to hear, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. There, there, there is two different things. There are ears that we can hear from, and there is a heart and an attitude and an obedience. And that's how we listen. We listen. I know so many times in my own life as a child, I heard my parents. I heard them. But I didn't listen. And I can't argue with them that I didn't listen. I didn't listen. I, oh, you didn't hear me. Oh, I heard you, Dad. Well, you didn't listen. You're right, I didn't listen. I didn't pay attention. I didn't heed what you wanted me to do. I did not obey what you asked of me. So if you want to dedicate yourself to, to the Lord and to obedience, you and I have to be hearers and what James would say what? Doers. Of the word. Don't be hearers only deceiving yourselves, but be doers of the word also. We also need to see in this passage in Psalm 40, uh, what counts comes from the heart. Right? This is a heart issue. It's not a, hey, here's my sacrifice. I put in my time. I checked off the boxes. I'm all squared away now. That's not the kind of listening that God wants from us. We see this in 1 Samuel 15. Samuel said, he said, does the Lord take pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as obeying the Lord? I mean, he set up a whole sacrificial system, right? But, but those sacrifices were to be made in faith from an obedient heart, not in a legalistic way, not in, okay, I brought my sacrifice, I'm, I'm good, see you later. Right? That, that is not acceptable to God. He goes on and says, look, to obey is better than to sacrifice. You, you might think, okay, I, I, I can hear and I can just plant myself, or I can hear and I can... I can be legalistic. That is not the same as being a doer of the word. And here's what I mean. You'll say, I've heard God say things, and you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, and I'm going to go to church. I'm going to sit down in church. I'll, I'll bear through the entire thing. And of course, God will have to accept that. Now, you heard, and you, you came to church, and you sat down, but you, it was, had nothing to do with listening to God. It had nothing to do with being obedient from your heart. It had everything to do with just checking off the boxes. You may have seen the offering plate come by and be like, oh, He's up the ante a little bit. Oh, I, can, I can take note of that. I'll, I'll get a tax deduction. Here we go. We drop it in the plate. And God's like, 
I'm rich. I don't need your money. I just want your heart. I want your heart. I want you to, as Matt prayed, we want to give generously. From the heart, not under compulsion, right? That's how we give. It, it's, it's that legalism that comes from just hearing. But doing, actually doing the word of God, being a listener and obedient to Jesus, comes from the heart. He, he eventually tells Saul, he says, you have rejected the word of the Lord, and he has rejected you as king. You, you may have heard, you may have tried your best to cross your T's and dot your I's. But in the end, your heart was far from him. Here's what he said. Saul, Saul responded to Samuel. He said this, I have sinned. Now he's getting to the heart, right? I've sinned. I've transgressed the Lord's command and your words. And he says, why? Because I was afraid of the people, I obeyed them. Don't we do that? Didn't we, didn't we see that when we know the true one? What did John say? Keep yourself from idols. Keep yourself from pleasing people. Keep yourself from that place so that your heart can be what? Free? Our hearts need to be free. Luke chapter 16, again, this is a heart issue, right? We talk about uh, dedicating ourselves to obedience. That's When we're ready to do God's will, we're dedicated to obedience. It's a heart issue. It's not just to sign, sign up and check off the list thing. Uh, Luke chapter 16, he told them, Jesus said, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the sight of others, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly admired by people is revolting in God's sight. I, I see that. And you go back to the letter to the churches, right? If, if you were neither warm or hot nor cold, you're what? You're lukewarm. And what did he want to do? He vomit you out of my mouth, Right? This, this seems similar to me. It's like you're trusting in, in people. You're trying to justify yourself on the side of others. You're just checking off the boxes. Your heart is far from me. Fine, you're doing what's admired by people. You might have everybody else fooled, but it is revolting in God's sight. Again, this is a heart issue. Now, there is some connection here, some messianic prophecy I want to look at in the last couple of verses. So while you and I might aspire to always be ready to do God's will, there is, there is one that David anticipates and that you and I know who will say with confidence everything and do God's will perfectly, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So yes, we ought to be ready to do his will, and we ought to be ready to dedicate ourselves to obedience and, and not only to be hearers of the word, but doers of the word from the heart. But we know that we won't always do that perfectly. But there is one who is and does. And we see that in Hebrews chapter 10. Um, the, the author in verses 1 through 3 sets up saying this, this offering system isn't perfect because you can never totally be perfect from it. And sin will always come back. So in verse 4 he says this, It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. If you're trying to earn your way, not from the heart, but just earn your way from checking off the boxes. It's impossible for that to forgive sins. And Jesus died on a cross so you and I could absolutely have our sins forgiven. But it's impossible if we're just going through the motions. Therefore, uh, he was, as he was coming into the world, this is Jesus, as Jesus was coming into the world, he said, so this is Jesus' words now, and he's quoting Psalm 40. You do not delight in sacrifice, or no, you do not desire sacrifice and offering, but you prepared a body for me. You did not delight in whole burnt offerings and sin offerings. Then I said, see, it is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, God. And after he says above, he says, you, you do not delight or desire in sacrifices and burnt offerings, whole burnt offerings and sin offerings, which are offered according to the law. Then he says, see, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first legalistic, sit and check off the boxes, to establish the second. By this will, this is the will of God, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once uh, for all time. Amen, right? See, there's not enough motions you and I could go through to get it all right. Thank God Jesus already did. Thank God we have the one while we are inadequate, while we are missing the mark, he's the one that hit it perfectly. And he's the one that sacrificed himself on a cross. He's the one who bled and died and was buried. He's the one that was risen to life because he is the God who is mighty to save. 
And he offers that salvation to you and to me, that we would be whole, that we would be forgiven, that we would be in a right relationship and standing with the God of the universe. And as, as he came humbly, and as he even says, uh, I, my desire is I've come to do your will, he now also offers us an example to follow. Amen? That you and I can see that Christ came, that he, he, he did something that we could never accomplish, but then he also set the example of what a servant's heart looks like. Not obedient to sacrifice, but obedient from the heart to the Father who is in heaven. That's the first half, and I pray that as we continue on in this, we are and will be ready to do God's will, but it will always come from the heart that you and I would stop fighting, that stop resisting, stop thinking Jesus died on the cross so you could have the best life now, but he died that you could be forgiven and be in heaven with him for all eternity. That's the hope we have. Amen. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer and move into worship? Father, we, we come to you uh, in, in humility, God, knowing that there are so many other things that we have put our trust in or, or at least set our focus towards. And, and God, I, I pray that you would, you would reveal that to us and you would reveal that those things are not trustworthy, that if, God, we are really ready to do your will, that we would trust in you, we'd wait on you with confidence because you are the God of our, God, our salvation, that you hear us, we, we know you hear us when we cry. Lord, that we would trust and remember all that you have done for us. And God, that would, would melt our heart and change our heart and conform us into the image of Christ. And God, we have a model of dedication and service and obedience to the will of the Father set in Jesus Christ that we can follow. God, change our heart. Let us not have cold, stubborn, hard hearts, but change our hearts, soften our hearts. Give us a new heart that we might see you for who you are. We might run to you in faith and trust and in hope. God, it's our desire, it's my desire from the heart that I can say I'm ready to do your will. And God, now as we, we enter back into worship, it is again the way we elevate you and, and tell you how worthy you are of all of our praise. It is a way that we through song would, would preach the word of God to our own hearts. That we would proclaim the word of God to the hearts of our brothers and sisters and that we would proclaim the goodness of God to a world who doesn't know him. It's a way we witness to people through the passionate worship that we enter into now. So help us as we do that. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's sing together.